So it is two o'clock, and I'm going to begin this on time. My name is David Cadman. I'm a, hi, I'm David. I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> I used to be with city council here in Vancouver for three terms. And then I was the president of ICLEI for three terms. And I'm now the past president of ICLEI. So our speak, this is the session, just to make sure you're in the right place, which is called Informal Solutions for Sustainable Urban Redesign to Reduce uh, the Weight of Cities. And it's the idea is to mesh uh, theory and practice at the community scale and look at transformative actions. And our first presenter will be Dr. Mar Martin Hager, who is the, an urbanist and political scientist and professor of urban futures at Utrecht University and a member of the UN's International Resource Panel. Our second speaker, and he'll speak for 25 minutes, our second speaker who will speak for seven minutes is Teresa Williamson, who is the executive direct director of Catalytic Communica Communities, an empowerment communications think tank it's an advocacy NGO working since 2000 in support of Rio's favelas. And in recognition of favelas' heritage status and their residents' right to be fully served as equal citizens. She's written a number of book chapters and opinion pieces in the New York Times. And then we have Eliana Souza Silva, founder of Redes de Mare, Rio de, uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, She's a consultant and re uh, researcher building the barricades. She's director of the Veres de Mare and an NGO in Rio. She's the curator director of WOW Rio de Janeiro, which is Women of the World Festival. And she's on the advisory board member of the Women of the World Global Foundation and the Institute of Advanced Studies uh, at the University of Sao Paulo. And our Another speaker is Richard J. Smith from Wayne State University. He's an associate, associate professor, University School of Social Work, Detroit, Michigan, and a core advisor for the International Eco City Standards and Focus uh, Hope Village Steering Committee. And Hebda Alal Khalil is a professor of sustainable, urb sustainable urbanism, professor of sustainable urbanism at the Department of Architecture, Faculty of Engineering, Cairo University, Senior Coordinator, Architectural Engineering Technology Program, and she's community development, research and community development, informal areas, urban climate, and integrated ur urban systems. And a research project focusing on gender equity and cities and land governance. So I'd like to invite, first of all, uh, Marhar Jihar up to the, to the, you could sit there or you can come up here. I, and there's a clicker up here, you can Click. make the system work. Okay, Gre you. Greens go forward, reds go backwards. Okay, like the usual. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, great to be part of this conversation. I look forward to uh, the discussion with the panel and uh, with you, obviously. Um, what I would like to do is share some ideas about um, the future of our cities in light of the fact that cities are going to become more and more important, as you heard in other panels uh, this morning already. And basically, the proposition is we have become accustomed to making cities in a particular way as if there was no alternative, and I think that is something we need to take issue with. I suppose that's the very foundational idea of the eco-cities gathering so that we find an entry point, a pathway into an alternative future. So that's my talk basically and now you get the slightly longer version. Um, in, in the Weight of Cities report, which uh, we did for the UN uh, International Resource Panel, um, we started with the statistics that you all know too well about the growing uh, percentage of our people living in cities. And I suppose the two things that I think are most important to consider are the two statistics on the right-hand side. On the one hand, the estimate of growing numbers of people living in informal settlements, and the second one, 
the growing number of people having middle class lifestyles. And both are equally problematic and we, we were very determined to think about an urban future that would do something about the detriment and the difficult situation of people in the informal settlements and at the same time address these middle classes that uh, will be with us uh, as UN DESA uh, anticipates. So in the Weight of Cities report, which came out in 2080, we did something strange. But that's very academic. What we did, actually, we calculated how much resources, how much, how much sand, how much cement, how much steel, how much glass, how much water, we needed to build the 40% of the urbanization of 2050 that still has to be built. And it won't surprise you that we came to the conclusion that if we continue building our cities in the way we have built them over the last century or so, we basically will blow the fuses of our planet. It's as simple as that. So as we are here, we're thinking about cities, you know, extending, uh, you know, a few apartment blocks, a new neighborhood, but obviously the, the crucial global issue is the urbanization taking place in China, in India, in Sub-Saharan Africa. These are the three places in the world where these, the, the bulk of the 40% that we were discussing uh, will, be, will be built. So if we take that as a given that we need to rethink then and, and with the idea that we want to reach environmental goals, do not blow the fuses of the planet, how can we then think about a particular alternative? So first of all, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that, but it is important to let that sink in because we're so accustomed to a particular way of building cities. We need to seriously consider and quickly alternative building materials because steel and cement are two of the really big culprits when it comes to the CO2 emissions of, of, uh, of this planet. And as, as you saw this morning already in the panel discussion, a statistic that's actually not from our report, but we use it a lot, is from Vaclav Smil, he's a sort of fantastic sort of uh, uh, colleague who always comes up with new statistics. And he calculated uh, that, the, that China in three years and it's not only in these three years that we're referring to here, 2011, 2013, but every three years in the 21st century, they use as much cement as the United States in the entire 20th century. So it gives you a sense. Look at the surroundings. I mean, is this building wood or is this building uh, concrete? And most of the buildings, of course, that were built recently, the last quarter of a century in, in Vancouver are concrete. And they're, we have to think about an alternative, and in that sense, you need a fundamental break with the past. But being an urban planner and a political scientist, I want to bring to the fore not only building materials, but actually building cities in a different way, because I think then we also have a vision that could be compelling and could be interesting for people to move towards. But before I do so, very quickly, the, the way in which we thought we could actually still get this all in balance, and that is indeed a mathematical equation which suggests that you have sort of multiplier effects, that if you change the urban form, if you combine it with energy conservation strategies, energy efficiency strategies, and people awareness lifestyle elements, you can actually get good cities, very nice to live in, thriving cities in Kate Rayworth phrase this morning with only a tenth of the resource requirement. So it's the, in that sense, the old rhetoric, there is an overshoot and there is a challenger scenario. But let me now try and, and detail that then a bit more. What you see also here in Vancouver, Vancouver is of course a city that many people think is, 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 is a way to the future, but look at how the city extends over its territory, its outside territory. Yeah? So what Ashimin has called telescopic urbanization, that is an sort of encroaching city. Most of the cities 
that are growing are in the deltas. The deltas have the most fertile soils. It means you are basically building on your best agricultural soils, so therefore you have to replace that somewhere else on less fertile soil, which will be a larger encroachment on biodiversity, etc. So rethinking urban form has a direct relationship with biodiversity and uh, with, with food. So at, at this moment, as we talk in Cape Town, there's a big debate on whether or not to build on uh, the, uh, the territory where they get most of the vegetables in the Cape Town conurbation from, build that, make that a city or not. And we argue vehemently against that. We argue vehemently that the future is in an articulated density that means that you have nodes, TOD in the, in the technical jargon, at, uh, um, transport oriented developments, and you can combine that with places that are green. So compared to a checkerboard, rather than the sort of the omelette of Vancouver, you would be much more in a checkerboard situation, having a city, having a green space, having a, a bit of the city. And Serge Salat, and I mentioned him, calculated that that would work. And the, and, and the interesting thing is, if you say density, most people are nervous. They, they don't want to move with you towards that future. But it is because people think about density as a generic term, that it has to be dense everywhere. But we actually break with that logic. So the articulated density says that in these nodes, you have to have to about 15,000 people per square kilometer, which is, order of magnitude, less dense than Barcelona or, or Paris in most arrondissements. And you can combine that with territories of six or 7,000 uh, people per square kilometer. But that is what you need to do. So a few things need to be out. Now, the planner in me just wants to reiterate the fact that we are sort of stuck in a world without alternatives. And it's perhaps not us uh, here, but in, in particular in the development world, the, the world of finance, they are used to a particular business case. And that business case actually originates in the mind of uh, the modernist architectural movement here depicted by, uh, by Le Corbusier, of course, who, as, and you're all familiar, I suppose, with this picture, who did something which we now find pretty extraordinary. He suggested to eradicate Le Marais, which is the arrondissement where Le Centre Pompidou is, for instance, and replace that with Plan Vazin, the high rise in the park, was his concept. Now, the interesting thing is that he, he, he thought of that idea in the 1920s, and it was replay, you know, done everywhere in 1954, for instance, in the Prit Ego building in St. Louis, and then in the, it was in the 1960s, rep repeated, it in, uh, repeated in Amsterdam, in the Belmermeer. But in what happened in 1972, we dynamited the Prit Eagle building. Eh? Charles Jenks, the architectural critic, says that's the, the end of modernism, the beginning of postmodernism. But if only he had been right, because the, the the tragedy of our development is that in 1992, we also eradicated the Belmemir, but what we do, we still build predominantly in that style, right? So the question is, in all these places like China, but also India, of course, we still stuck with a modernist imaginary that stands in the way of an alternative. Suburbanization, I mean, coming from the airport, that's what, what I saw around me. I mean, Vancouver, of course, is known the images for, for its downtown, but this is, of course, what you get most of the time. And if you think about that, not in terms of individual lives, but in terms of sewage pipes, you, you realize, of course, that it requires so much more material to build that. And, of course, you ha always have to go somewhere. There is nothing to do except for uh, the suburban life. And the third sort of urbanization pattern is that, of course, of the informal settlements. So the, they, they emerge. They don't sort of, they're not planned. They emerge. And, of course, this is how people try and escape poverty and make a living. And so the, these three patterns of urbanization are all deeply problematic. 
I think there's only one type that survives, and that's the neighborhood. And, and, and the neighborhood can be an old one, like in Nuremberg that, that we uh, saw this, this morning in, in, the, in the talk. Um, but it can also be newly built. And I personally, and I th I'm sure that some Canadians will, will be surprised, but I think that what uh, the Canadians did in Toronto and uh, Regent Park actually shows you that you can actually rebuild the city as a mixed, socially mixed territory with also possibility for people to actually live there rather than uh, only have a, have a home. Um, and that, I think, is a good alternative. We get to the sort of densities that we need. So if you want to put it in a single line, I would say, don't provide housing, build neighborhoods. And I think, in particular, for the situation in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and so forth, this is, I mean, this is a crucial difference and the question is, how can you transition from an informal situation or from a suburban situation to, to these neighborhood-led developments? So my point in, in, the, in, in this, if I think about it academically, I think we're stuck with an imaginary of the past that's problematic. How can we come to a new imaginary? Now, an imaginary is something that, that suddenly is very much in the debate uh, among geographers, sociologists, uh, planners. And there are many definitions, but I like this one personally. It's collectively held and performed visions of desirable futures. So the idea is that before you build, you're actually captured by, by an idea about the future. And I think we must realize this is a politics of the imagination. If you can capture the minds of people, you, you nearly won the battle. And I see two really powerful imaginaries at the moment that, that are both deeply problematic. One is one belt, one road. So the, it, is an, it is, of course, an alternative to the fact that, that you know, the West no longer provides development aid, the countries have difficulty in coping with their situation, so there, there's a lot of borrowing and lending going on, but it, the imaginary is important because it is, of course, focused on a resource exchange, finances for resources, and the question is if you then build the right elements of a thriving city. Now, the second one is probably more familiar, and it's smart cities. Now, I'm really happy that that imaginary seems to be over the hill, so in the sense that it's less powerful than a couple of years ago. My worry there is that it's a corporate imaginary that was really capturing the mindset of municipal uh, politicians. I tried to sort of narrate that story in a book, which is out of print, but you can free down, uh, you're free to download it at uh, www.pbl.nl. And uh, if you Google the title, I suppose you get to the PDF as well. And the point is that we said, well, you know, don't focus on these technologies. You have to think from the urban towards what technologies want to, you want to do for you. The Songdo experience is one in which you can actually see what happens if you don't think about social inclusiveness, if you don't think about the ecological underpinnings and, and what then basically happens to your, to your urban environment. Or this picture from Siemens, uh, not that I don't like Siemens, but it, it shows you the imaginary of an engineer. I mean, I would, as a, as a planner, never draw a city like this, but it's all input-output. It it's shows you how a smart city preoccupation thinks about the urban fabric. Now, to, to develop a few alternatives, we organized at the uh, Urban Future Studio a post-fossil city contest, and I want to show you one set of images that, that was developed in that context, and that interestingly, and, and I'm really happy and uh, uh, supposedly contributed to that, also made it to the cover of The Weight of Cities. So Carl Schulschenk and Blake Robinson from South Africa said, well, this is what is the imaginary in South Africa and in many sub-Saharan African countries. The idea to borrow money, to get financial capital into your city, have malls, have security, have uh, uh, more vehicles in the street and push out those who, that don't fit to that imaginary. 
And they said, well, we need an alternative picture. And they came up with this, eh, so which suggests it is much more about appreciating the economy that is there, have an eye for the local cultures, allow nature in, and also, and that's important in, this, in, the, in the heart of this picture, make that people live in these inner cities in a mixed uh, use situ situation. And that they thought that making it into a picture would be a powerful way to allow people to relate to the possibility of an alternative. Now to relate to that, I think one may say that thinking about neighborhoods, well-functioning neighborhoods, might be an imaginary from below. And, and that was what I thought may be a topic for our uh, panel. So the idea that what we could put against that, we don't have the weight of commercial advertisement like people from the, from the smart city background, but we can narrate good functioning urban neighborhoods. We can narrate how informal settlements gradually can become more formalized. And I'm sure that people who are more familiar with others may disagree, but I was struck by this, this neighborhood. So it's to the east of Addis Ababa, and what you so often not see, and definitely not in a modernist urban planning, what they did, they allowed for the whole uh, uh, ground floor to be a place for a market. So for the informal peddlers to formalize in that context. And I think that is a very good way to slowly allow an informal settlement to formalize and not have to change their whole economy, economy but only gradually do that. On the other hand, I suppose, this is also interesting. Eh? I mean, even in Europe, if I show these pictures and say, well, this roof terrace is actually a roof terrace of the collective space of a social housing project. This is their fantastic view on the Toronto downtown. And this is also what came out of a participatory process. People had no bank in their neighborhood. People had no supermarket or market where they could buy their own foods, but here it is supplied as a consequence of well-organized from the bottom-up participatory process. However, I do not believe that bottom-up alone will be sufficient. I think we have to appreciate the steering power of infrastructure and let's keep in mind that that is where a lot of money is channeled to and we need to have an argument about particular infrastructures if you want to be successful. L and link infrastructure, of course, then to land use policy. This is a familiar picture that really drives that message home. On the left-hand side, Atlanta. On the right-hand side, Barcelona. You've probably have seen the picture. Same number of inhabitants and the CO2 emissions are about you know, six times higher transport-related CO2 emissions in Atlanta simply because for everything you need to get into your car. In the Cerda grid of Barcelona, that's not the case. You can walk, you can take the metro and, and the like. So there is a relationship between infrastructure decisions and CO2 emissions and obviously also social cohesion. Here, this is where it's interesting. This is a Chinese-funded light rail project. It's the only light rail that is available at the moment in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and others. It's at the moment does not function well, but I still think the fact that it is there, that you can use that and that it structures all your urbanization is an incredible asset. So if we do have a calculation like the new climate economy report has, that there is about um, 87 to 92 trillion investment in dollars in new urban infrastructure just lined up f f up to 2030. Tweak it. The difference between 87 and 92 is the difference between a business as usual modernist investment and a low carbon scenario. That's the difference between two completely different worlds. Now, I think there's another thing we do with, with infrastructure. There is a symbolics of infrastructure that we, use, we have to use. So here's a picture of the new station in Rotterdam. Now compare that to Penn. This, this is, without the intention actually, showing what a low carbon city can be like. 
what the post-carbon city is like. There is no car because they're only under, uh, they're in a tunnel. You know, the, so the, the, the surface at which we want to live is for pedestrians and it's for bikes. It shows that people who go into public transport are not poor people. This is the preferred option. In the, the Netherlands, I mean, if, if, if you're a barrister, you, you use a bike because it doesn't make sense to use a car. It doesn't get you anywhere. So even people in a higher job segments are using bikes. And I think this epitomizes an alternative preference. Of course, Copenhagen is the same thing. I mean, if you just want bicycles from A to B, you don't build this. You build this because you want to convey we like you on your bicycles. We actually are going to spend more money, throw it at you, so that we have an infrastructure that's fun every morning. Or here in Amsterdam, uh, this used to be a four-lane motorway in the city, and it's now only for bikes and the streetcars. Now, my final point is the governance issue. I think here, too, we need to think about an alternative. I mean, think about the fundamentals that are hidden in the post-fossil future. Rethink energy sources, rethink mobility, rethink shelter, rethink food. This is basically rethinking our whole life. But can we do that in the same politics that we used to have? I don't think so. So first of all, we need to allow ourselves to be more political about emissions. Because as Stephanie Pinsettel said so nicely, we need to know who is using what flows where to do what. A CO2 mo molecule is always the same, but it makes a difference whether it's for a freezer or for really primary needs of people uh, who are really poor. Make an analysis of where these flows are used for. And I think you have to also face the fact, and this is something that, that is not it's definitely in a UN contest, it's very difficult to actually put to words, but of course, there is a lot of capture of the political. And I think an alternative entrepreneurial urban governance, as we detail in the report, may be less vulnerable for corruption and capture than the system that we presently have. Of course, competing cities, like in the old neoliberal imaginary, has to make way for cooperative cities where we share our solutions and less focus on a hierarchical government and more on a collaborative government. And there I think, and that's nice that you're our chair, I think we still do not use enough the possibility of, of these horizontal fora, like ICLE. Uh, so, I mean, it's, and it should go beyond sharing pictures of solutions. It's, ICLE and so forth should be in the position to explain when a solution actually works and what made it into a, a, a solution. So it must be more boring. It must be about law, about business cases, all these things that underpin a solution so as to make sure that people don't imitate and, and then are surprised not to have the same success as the initial, say, um, rapid bus system in uh, Latin America. So in, in this talk, I also suggested perhaps it's these imaginaries that are part and parcel of the eco-cities narrative are important to invest in, but we should pay perhaps more attention to the level at which we want to do that. And so a street scrape or a home is one thing, but that has no leverage. So I come to the conclusion that the neighborhood may be precisely the level where you still can talk meaningfully about a humane city, but at the same time have the leverage that we can do it all in time for avoiding a climate catastrophe. So this is all in the new book, Neighborhoods for the Future. I hope to have it out in April 2020. If you have a suggestion for a better subtitle, please approach me. Uh, but the main title is, uh, is ready for it. And here are the takeaways. We can still, I think, make this into a best century. I'm not a pessimist in that sense. You can't afford yourself pessimism. But we need to then allow back into our discussion urban planning. Revisit the normative, the good city in that debate, and don't leave it to people who have an MBA background. 
allow for soft paths of transition out of informal settlements, out of the high rise. Don't give them up, but make them into neighborhoods, and precisely the same for suburbs. Invest in these imaginaries from below. Use urban infrastructure as a major lever for change. And also appreciate the symbolic value that things in our public domain have for people seeing a perspective for themselves. That is the future that I want. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Martin. Can I call Teresa, please? Hi, good afternoon. While we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, I'm Teresa Williamson. I run an NGO in Rio called Catalytic Communities. Since I only have seven minutes and I have a lot to share, uh, please don't be scared. I'm going to go through a lot of slides. Um, this presentation is available on Google Slides at the link at the bottom, so you can look over them later uh, as, you, as you like. Um, the organization I run, Catalytic Communities, has been working for 19 years supporting favela organizers. That's who we work with. We've worked with hundreds of communities across Rio. Uh, and so I'm just going to situate you a little bit in that work uh, and why these communities exist before I talk a little bit about our work with the sustainable favela network of local organizers. So um, as a or just a precursor, um, we see our, the Sustainable Development Goal 11 as our focus. Uh, sustainable cities and communities, not the orange canopy of the tree, but without social justice and accountable institutions, none of it can happen. Uh, this is very clear in the case of Rio. So I'll ask you all, how many of you recognize the city? Rio. How many of you know that Rio was the largest slave port in world history? Rio alone, one city, received five times the number of enslaved Africans as the entire United States. And slavery in Brazil lasted 60% longer than the US. Uh, Rio was the federal capital in the 1890s when slavery was abolished in 1888. Uh, and for many other reasons, Brazil was a fast urbanizing country already at the time. So people came to Rio, and that's why the first favela, Providencia, as it's called today, was formed at the time. Uh, we're 120 years into this uh, experience of favelas in Rio. These are not slums. These are not temporary neighborhoods. They're not overwhelmingly precarious. What they are is neglected, repressed, underserved. 24% um, of the city's population lives in these communities. You can see them all over the urban fabric. They're everywhere. They're the reds and the oranges on the map of Rio. And the logic of that slaveholding society is what runs Rio to this day. All of our policies, our approaches, it's not lack of technical expertise. It's not lack of resources as we saw in the pre-Olympic period. It's a policy of maintaining uh, social uh, privilege for some at the expense of many. Favela residents are not at fault for the uh, challenges that we face in Rio. So let's look at favelas through another lens. Now, 120 years of history, what do these consolidated neighborhoods do? Right? In the context globally, we've heard a lot at this conference about how human population growth in our lifetimes is happening in informal settlements. Uh, according to uh, architect Justin McGurk, 85% of all housing worldwide is built illegally. This is not something unique to Rio. But because Brazil's favelas and Latin America in general are more established and consolidated, learning from them is critical to uh, embracing and working with the reality of informality in Africa and Asia. So what are Rio's favelas? There are four main elements. They're simply neighborhoods that develop out of an un unmet need for affordable housing with no outside regulation, so they're self-built. That's the informal nature. They're established by residents, uh, so that means every brick Every tile was laid by somebody's ancestor or somebody's cousin. Uh, and they evolve based on access to jobs, resources, the city. So they're very diverse. There are a thousand of them across Rio, and every one of them is different from the other. And every one of them is different from itself a week apart. Incredibly complex places. Uh, again, they're affordable housing, informal, self-built, unique. Just putting it another way. Our organization, over 19 years, we've identified a host of qualities that 
urban planners like myself and many of you look to integrate into our cities. I'll mention the organic, um, organic architecture, which is completely different from, for example, public housing, and yet people obviously often lump these communities together. Uh, you know, when somebody, often families will buy a shack in a community, and it is a shack initially, uh, precarious titling, et cetera. Uh, their baby's born, they add a room, their child grows up, they add a floor for their family, they become unemployed, they move upstairs and open a shop below, uh, they need leisure space, they open a rooftop terrace, they need extra income, they open a floor to rental. They're incredibly uh, flexible environments for the people who live in them. And their sociocultural assets, urbanistic and economic qualities. And here are just some images from different favelas in Rio, different levels of development, different levels of public infrastructure, And uh, our previous mayor uh, did a lot of, you know, he had a lot of um, work trying to, he, he, would, he would talk about the importance of formalizing favelas as if formalization is the opposite of informal. Informal is the absence of the formal. And actually, when you look at favelas, it's just a, it's a different logic structure, it's a different lifestyle. So we have to be very aware when we make decisions to, quote, formalize informal settlements or employment, et cetera, to be aware of the qualities that, are, that do exist in the informal uh, so that we can find ways to in integrate that. So I'll quickly go, this is Brody Fisher, who's a historian at University of Chicago on Brazil. She points out that informality is a, is a modern concept because before, everything was informal. You know, visit Santorini or Valparaíso. There are a lot of double standards involved in this movement. I won't go through this slide too much. This is all about complexity. Um, also, you know, just it's important to note that 20% of population of any city in the world can't afford the market rate. This is just a basic, con you know, natural market con precept concept. And so we need to be aware of that when we build cities. And informal settlements in the developing world are responding to that. In Rio, there's not. Uh, it's not an accident. 24% of our city. Uh, is informal. It's just meeting that demand. Quickly about our organization, um, Catalytic Communities. We have worked for 19 years with uh, hundreds of communities, uh, th over 1,000 local organizers. Uh, we, instead of traditional international development or community development, it's not even community development, traditional development as it's applied in the world, we undertake an asset-based community development approach, which is all about building on community assets, identifying what those assets are, looking for those assets and then building, solving issues with residents, and residents are actually the ones in control of these processes, so it's not even with them, you know, it's not uh, anything that we announce, it's something that residents initiate, but we support these processes. So I won't go into all that, these are some of the different programs we've done over the years. Uh, we have three major programs today. I'll just mention the Sustainable Favela Network. We became known during the pre-Olympic period for some of our reporting, but now I just wanted to quickly finish up just telling you a bit about the Sustainable Favela Network. Uh, we, this network essentially was, um, the seed was planted in 2012 for the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit when we produced a film with community partners called Favela is a Sustainable Model. It's available on YouTube. Uh, we've done other activities like, for example, a study with a lead ND architect comparing the Olympic Village with a favela nearby, showing that the community actually met the standards even better. Uh, there's a favela in Rio that's built its own green sewage system. They just need some basic resources now to finish connecting all the homes in the community and they'll have the cleanest sewage in the city of Rio will be in a favela. Uh, they've, this is an article where they talk, this is an article where they talk about that case. Uh, so our network is all over Rio. It's over 130 initiatives that are mapped that are doing everything from solar and biodigesters to environmental education, community museums, uh, and so on. Here are a couple of examples of these projects. Uh, we lead these exchanges where communities meet up across communities to share their solutions uh, and work together. And then finally, we have seven working groups along many of the themes of the SDGs. Uh, these working groups, they came up naturally through the process of community meetings and identifying what the common things were in the network of communities we're working on. 
And so there's solid waste, solar energy, et cetera. And each of these groups has many proposals for things that they want to do from the grassroots uh, to develop favelas into their potential as sustainable communities. So just this is a final slide, I believe. Um, just to show our work in context, I didn't mention it uh, fully, but we do basically three groups of activities. We work on the narrative of favelas, like I did in the beginning of my presentation, get people to understand these communities better um, with nuance and mostly through community perspectives. We report a lot of community written articles and journal community journalists we work with. Um, grassroots organizing, like the Sustainable Favela Network and other efforts. And then we also have a project called the Favela Community Land Trust to secure land rights in these communities that's consistent with uh, collective their collective uh, history. So they get collective, they're working towards collective access to the land and individual ownership of their homes rather than in full individual land titles which can actually atomize a community and produce gentrification. So these are three projects that we see that work together to actually give us a path to work with informal settlements on their terms in ways that actually integrate them into cities and allow us to build off the qualities that they've developed. Um, it's really important for us, I just want to finalize by saying it's really important for us to recognize that there's a difference between a slum or shanty town when it's first settled and people want nothing more than to get out of there and have a better option and a neighborhood that has evolved over time from that informality and may still be informal, but is consolidated and vibrant. Residents there know that they want to stay, and all they need is help and support to be able to uh, build on what they've already created all by themselves uh, with little s support previously. So thank you very much, and look forward to questions. Thank you, Teresa. Can I call Eliana to the microphone, please? So Eliana uh, is going to speak in Portuguese. I'm going to translate for her. Boa tarde. Eu, na verdade, vou falar um pouco. A Teresa deu uma visão geral sobre a questão das favelas no Rio de Janeiro, né? E essa discussão sobre a questão da informalidade. So I'm going to speak a little. Since Teresa has already given an introduction to favelas in Rio, I'm going to talk uh, from a local perspective, community perspective. É, na verdade, assim, a ideia é, é em, em cinco minutos falar um pouco sobre a experiência da maior favela do Rio de Janeiro, que é o conjunto de favelas da Maré. So the idea is to speak for five minutes about the experiences of the largest favela complex in Rio, which is the Maré Favelas. Eu, nasci, eu cresci numa das favelas da Maré, Nova Holanda. A Maré são 16 favelas. I was raised in one of the largest favelas, or I was raised in one of the communities of Maré, called Nova Holanda. E desde a década de 70, 80, essa favela que, que era, na verdade, seis favelas, hoje são 16 favelas. And since, é, aperta aqui. Eram seis? Eram seis. Na década de 70. So since the 1970s, the number of communities of Maré went from 6 to 16. Opa, volta, peraí. É, são 16 favelas, fica no centro da cidade do Rio de Janeiro. É um conjunto de favelas que está entre as três principais vias de acesso da cidade do Rio de Janeiro, uma baía, que é a Baía de Guanabara, so there's 16 communi favela communities that are centrally located in Rio. It's between three of the major access routes of Rio and next to the bay, the Guanabara Bay. É uma favela que, é, na verdade, foi crescendo. São, são 16 favelas, mas, na verdade, dessas 16, 11 foram conjuntos habitacionais construídos pelos governos municipais. There are 16 favelas, but actually 11 of them started as public housing projects built by the government. E é importante falar que uh, o que nós estamos chamando de informalidade, as favelas no Rio de Janeiro, talvez seja a única opção que essa população, né, que é mais de 20% da população do Rio de Janeiro, tem de sobreviver nessa cidade. It's important to rem remember that we're talking about, when we say informality, we're talking about people who, this is their option, this is their only option to survive in Rio, and it represents over 20% of the population. Uh, na minha trajetória, eu fui presidente de uma associação é, comunitária dentro da Maré, que é a Nova Holanda, onde eu cresci. Eu, eu, eu criei algumas organizações 
tudo numa perspectiva de tentar pensar justamente como garantir direitos muito básicos nessa região. So I was raised in Maré and as a, a young leader I was elected president of the Residents Association in my community and since then I've founded two NGOs that work to help uh, develop the community. A, a, a organização que eu dirijo atualmente, a Rede da Maré, eu vou partilhar com vocês nesses poucos minutos duas experiências que eu acho que têm é, a ver com essa perspectiva de pensar como essas populações elas criam né, alternativas potenciais de vida. So the organization I'm going to talk about is Redes da Maré or Maré Development Maré um, Maré Development Networks, uh, and I'm going to talk about two experiences that Redes da Maré has Conducted to benefit the community. A Rede da Maré trabalha a partir de cinco eixos básicos que nós acreditamos que são eixos estruturantes para mudar a vida de uma população de 140 mil pessoas que residem nessas 16 comunidades e, portanto, a Maré tem uma população que maior, maior que 96,4% da, da, das cidades brasileiras. So, Rede da Maré works along five themes uh, and uh, working to, to benefit 150,000 residents of the community. Uh, the community is actually larger than 96% of Brazilian municipalities. Morando numa, numa, numa dimensão de 4 km e meio. They live within a four and a half kilometer radius. Então, um dos eixos de trabalho que nós temos é o desenvolvimento territorial. One of the themes is territorial development. Que é justamente um, um eixo que trabalha é, o direito de morar na maré, né, de trabalhar a questão habitacional, mas que, que, também a questão é, ambiental. Which helps uh, supports the community's recognition of its right to be on in on this uh, land and to have environmental environmental sustainability. O fato da maré é, estar entre as principais vias de acesso do Rio de Janeiro, isso faz com que o ar da maré seja o ar mais é, poluído que nós temos na cidade do Rio de Janeiro. The fact that maré is between three of the major roads in Rio means that it's got the worst air quality in the city. Para se ter uma ideia da, da, da gravidade disso, para ter um impacto é, nessa região, para melhorar a qualidade do ar, nós temos que plantar 30 mil mudas de árvores para ver um impacto nessa, nessa região, para melhorar a questão da saúde, principalmente. We've calculated that to actually impact the air quality and bring it to closer to a standard, uh, they'd ha we have to plant 30,000 trees. Então, nós temos um desafio que é, é pensar em alternativas numa região tão densa, com um, uma extensão é, de casas, é, tão, são 47 mil domicílios, uma extensão grande para uma área pequena, como é que a gente cria um impacto para garantir minimamente que as pessoas vivam ali. So we're constantly trying to figure out how, with so many people in, in this small amount of land, how do we generate impacts to actually improve the quality of life for people to be able to stay and live well. E aí, para finalizar, porque não tem mais tempo de falar, pode. O, é, é, rapidamente, só para dizer que é, a, nós somos uma organização que ve, a gente vem trabalhando historicamente para que a própria população da Maré construa essas alternativas de garantir direitos muito básicos. Né? E isso vem acontecendo. So we've worked a lot around human rights and helping residents build uh, strategies and, and to achieve these rights. Então, nós somos uma, uma organização que formada basicamente por moradores que há mais de 20 anos vem garantindo coisas muito básicas, que é o direito de existir nessa região e de minimamente pensar em soluções que, que é, melhorem a qualidade de vida. So for decades we've been working as an organization mainly of residents uh, to improve the conditions for everyone in the community. Então, um problema que nós temos muito sério quando a gente pensa em viver na cidade, em garantir direitos básicos de uma população como a da Maré, é, tem a ver com outros direitos que estão além até muitas vezes da própria questão ambiental. Então, no caso do, do Rio de Janeiro, no caso da favela da Maré e das favelas de uma maneira geral, a questão da segurança pública é uma questão muito séria, porque morrem é, no Brasil mais de 60 mil pessoas por arma de fogo e a maioria dessas pessoas morrem em favelas e periferias. So we can't start in our community doing anything without addressing human rights and public security. Uh, 60 mil. 60 mil. Morre por arma de fogo. 60,000 people die in Brazil every year from weapons. 
Então, é, nesse contexto, é, as questões... Nós temos questões muito, muito graves de desafios para garantir questões muito básicas de viver na cidade, mas a questão da, das violências em torno da questão bélica ela é, é um item que tem que ser pensado nessa questão ambiental, que vai muito além é, de pensar... É, essa cidade inteligente, essa cidade, é, enfim, ecologicamente, acho que tem que trazer essa questão da, da, da violência para essa discussão e como essas populações são atingidas. We have to bring the issue of violence to these discussions around sustainability because we're not going in our community. We, we can't even think about sustainability uh, being victimized by, by especially police violence. Acho que não dá mais tempo de ah. falar, né? É isso. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Obrigado, Eliana. Richard, can I call you to the microphone? What up, Doe? <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about informal solutions for sustainable in development in Detroit. Uh, and you can think of this as a formal city having neighborhoods and suburbs that are becoming informal through infrastructure, aging infrastructure, uh, retrenchment, austerity, and uh, uh, emergency management. Oh, okay. First, Detroit does all these things that many of the cities represented here are doing to reduce the weight. Uh, bike lanes, um, green alleys, uh, reuse of industrial facilities. Um, one interesting thing uh, in the path to get from Motor City to Eco City, one experiment thinking of going from mansions to tiny homes, that's done by uh, Cass Community Social Services. Um, some of my uh, former students have been working with that. Uh, small footprint, uh, maybe one room, two rooms. Uh, that's one way to reduce the weight. In terms of decoupling carbon reduction and economic growth, uh, I'm, uh, in addition to being a resident of the city of Detroit, uh, I am an associate professor at the Wayne State School of Social Work. Uh, my dean, uh, as part of a campus-wide initiative, asked me to form a social entrepreneurship committee. And of course, one doesn't often think of social workers as entrepreneurial, so we decided that we were going to be social entrepreneurship as social justice. Uh, we've had two conferences convening from the social entrepreneurship ecosystem in the city. Uh, we brought Uh, we partnered with the Build Institute. They train entrepreneurs, uh, and they also sponsor a crowdfunding community dinner called Detroit Soup, where people come, they bring a dish, they also, uh, people present community projects that need funding. The people attending vote, whoever wins, uh, gets to take home um, the door uh, entry fees. Uh, we had people speak on sustainable beekeeping, Uh, we even had a storytelling lesson from one of the brides of Funkenstein, formerly of Parliament Funkadelic, Satori Shakur. Uh, we had Morgan Simon speak on impact investing uh, to redirect endowments and pension funds to non-carbon-intensive carbon industries. The most exciting part of, of some of the enterprises we've, we've featured um, come from Highland Park, Uh, what do you do when your energy utility repossesses your streetlights? This happened, Highland Park couldn't afford to pay the electric bill for streetlights, so they just made an agreement with the utility to take them back, and they asked the residents to just turn their porch lights on instead. Um, but this did trigger the creation of a cooperative, energy justice cooperative, that started um, arranging for the bulk purchasing of solar street lights, and also solar porch lights. That led uh, some people in the neighborhood to say, hey, maybe we can assemble the solar uh, lights. So Ryder Cooperative Industries were founded. 
And then this ecosystem said, hey, uh, we need to create an investment pool because banks aren't financing what we want to do. So that led to the creation of the Detroit Community Wealth Fund, uh, which is being run by uh, another social worker on our committee. Um, uh, Detroit is also heavily involved with the food justice uh, space. Um, uh, D-Town Farms is a seven-acre organic farm in one of the city parks. Uh, Afrocentric uh, foods, uh, sustainably harvested. There's a, a rainwater catchment, wind power. Uh, there's a vegan pop-up culture in Detroit. Uh, one of my students now runs the Detroit Food Policy Council to try to coordinate some of these food efforts. Um, the, uh, there's a, a network of localized farmers markets, including in the Hope Village that I've been working with. Uh, we just celebrated Zero Food Waste Month. Uh, Kirsten was having me post pictures of, for Zero Waste Month, so I've been doing that. Um, and finally, closing the circular economy with culture. Our recycling industry actually supports a lot of cultural events that try to support a positive culture to destigmatize waste as an asset. All right, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Heba, can I call you to the mic? Okay, thank you for having me. So I'm, uh, I'll be the last presenter, so uh, thank you for keeping up with us. So, um, yep. Uh, my first uh, question would be, is, is consuming less uh, equals more green, the, the weight of cities? If you look at um, the, how the consumption happens in the different uh, African countries, yes, we do consume less than the biocapacity, but you're not providing enough for our residents. We are uh, less in the Human Development Index. If you look at uh, Cairo, yes, um, if you Google it, very nice pictures with the Nile and very nice buildings, but the reality, the urban reality is quite different when you know that 60% or more of, of my city is informal and they are very vibrant city. They are not very vibrant areas, they are not slums. If you see Cairo in 1904 and just in 100 years, then it is completely built. And just this is the island in the Nile, that's why it's not built, but otherwise everything is built. Sorry. So how can we de decouple the impact of resource uh, usage and economic uh, and environmental uh, um, impact? Uh, the city is uh, informally growing from uh, one end to the other. It's almost 100 kilometers, and the urbanism always follows resources. We do use more resources than we have. That's why we rely in, in, uh, on imports very much. Our ecological footprint uh, surpasses our biocapacity. So, um, yeah, this is the, the city of 20 million people or more. So, just to give you an idea, what is uh, informalization in Cairo? We have agricultural land. We illegally subdivide it. Uh, so, we own the land. We are not encroaching on others' land. And in 30 years or more, we have this. So, basically, from this side to this side in less than 30 years or so. You have very dense neighborhood. These are not slums. These are consolidated neighborhoods with mixed uses. So how can we provide equitable uh, cities that also uh, cater for the needs of various inhabitants, inhabitants uh, for the uh, prosperity of both the affluent as well as the vulnerable uh, groups? So how can, can we learn from this uh, informal growth? This is a question I always pose, and I certainly try to find an answer for it. As if you look at the, the city, the um, Sorry, the blue parts are the informal or the unplanned areas, while the yellow parts are the planned area, which is less than 40% of the city. So we started a research project in collaboration with EcoCity Builders. We investigated different uh, neighborhoods or, or districts around the city. Imbaba is an informal district of 1 million inhabitants or more, and uh, Zamalek is also around 70,000 inhabitants. The methodology, we rely very much on a participatory action research. So, so we go to the people, we discuss with them their needs, we go on transit walks, we, have, uh, we map the area because there is very scarce data from the municipality. We do, um, uh, we identify different archetypes, do uh, heavy in investigations. We follow up the resources uh, upstream and downstream, come up with Sankey diagrams, 
suggest some, uh, some uh, proposals, go back to the community, have another discussion, and think what can be done afterwards. So how do informal systems contribute to cities' weight? So if we're looking at the weight of cities, are the informal sector and informal areas contributing negatively or positively? Surprisingly, the, the, of course, the informal areas, they use less resources. They, um, they don't throw much, so their garbage is most, uh, mostly organic. While, uh, sorry, the, the other area, that's the, the Zamalek area, they, re, they use uh, a lot of resources, but they recycle uh, 70 to 80 percent. Interestingly, the recycling happens by the informal sector. So again, the informal sector helps reducing the weight of the city. So we have the low consumption and high reuse for the informal areas, as well as the recycling rate. If you look at mobility, in Mbaba, most people rely on buses, as well as the subway. While in Zamalek, most people rely on motorized vehicles, of course. So again, the informal area or the informal systems of the buses and the uh, tuk-tuks and as well as the um, subway rely, help reduce the weight of, of the city. So you have the high reliance on public transportation on one side versus the motorized vehicles, then uh, buses and minimal usage of subway for the higher income people. Although the neighborhood of Zamalek is walkable, but most destinations are outside the area, which is a, again a problem of urban planning. Where are the jobs uh, found? So, how to capture the characteristics of these informal uh, local ecosystems, the affordability, accessibility, and efficiency, and reduce, of our, uh, and reduce, the, reduce the weight of our city? Thank you. Thank you, Eva. There's microphone one, microphone three, microphone five, microphone two, four, and six. We're going to take a couple of questions from the floor. If you want to ask a question, go to a mic. Microphone two. Try again. Sure. Ah, who wants that one? I suggest. Yeah, go for it. Here. So yes, um, thank you for this question. We started a, um, a re recent uh, research about gender and the city, and we're identifying the different patterns of use of women in terms of the mobility, how they go around the city, as well as, of course, how they consume. Most of, if, if you know more about the informal waste pickers, those who actually sort are the women and the children. So they are the ones who go through the garbage, get out what is recyclable. So they contribute positively if you were talking about reducing the weight of the city. And um, yes, they have varied um, trans mobility uh, patterns, behavior than the, man the male. This is all, uh, all around the world. And of course, this is uh, the reality of Cairo. No meu caso, a questão de gênero é, fez, faz toda a diferença. Né? Todas as lutas que nós temos, que empreendemos na Maré, no Conjunto de Favelas da Maré, foram feitas por mulheres. Inclusive, nós temos um espaço chamado A Casa das Mulheres da Maré, que é justamente para trabalhar esse protagonismo e melhorar as condições de vida das mulheres que, no nosso caso, são muito precárias. Eliana says that the vast, that the vast majority of the initiatives in Maré are taken by women, these community initiatives, uh, and that her organization has a house uh, called the House of Women's, the Women's Struggle Fight, where women work, to, uh, where they support women becoming even further protagonists in the social change in the community. Okay, I don't see anyone else at the mic. Is anyone on their way to them? Okay, I'm going to then say thank you to... Number six. Oh, number six. oh, number six. You made it. Go. <laughs> we can't hear. You're going to have to be louder. Okay. Sure, go for it. So uh, in Rio, we, both in our Favela Community Land Trust project and in the Sustainable Favela Network, uh, a third or half of the participants are technical allies. Um, they're not technical experts. Uh, everybody there is an expert. In fact, community uh, leaders are the experts. So there's a, a fundamental role 
Uh, nothing can be done without everyone. It's an ecosystem. Everybody needs to be there. It's all about the framing and who's, in the, who's directing and controlling the process. Uh, but yeah, there's, we can always talk more later if you're interested, but we have uh, uh, approaches to, to doing this work. Yeah. Martin. Um, I think that's a really good question because also uh, the example from Cairo shows how difficult it is to reach sort of an optimal situation where you also have jobs in these emerging neighborhoods. Eh? So um, can we go beyond sort of a dichotomy between the informal and the formal? It's, and it's really difficult. There are lots of experiments where planners are devoted to uh, trying to sort of formalize an informal settlement to make it more diverse. But I think it is, the question is absolutely uh, to the point. Microphone four. Is, is there a difference between the formal and the informal in terms of uh, the neighborhood's capacity to survive climate change? Anyone want that one? Well, I suppose the, uh, an informal settlement is, is uh, self-reliant much more than uh, a middle class depending on really long change of uh, supplies uh, in that sense. Um, but they tend to be built in areas that are very vulnerable for climate change effects. Uh, so in, in the favelas, they often in a hilly situation, for instance, but you, you know obviously much more about it. So that it's, it's diverse, but the, I mean, if you see what happens if, if cities become richer, they, it is not a process of adding, it's actually killing an informal sector. So in Nairobi, for instance, you can see that very well, supermarkets taking over the role of uh, everyday market stalls along the roads makes, creates new dependencies, of course, for people to source their foods, and that may make them uh, much more vulnerable than the informal system. Are you waiting for another comment? Can I just add to that? Yeah. There's somebody next to me. Can I add to that? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, hello? Oh, there we go. Um, for, I recommend everyone here check out a community organization in San Juan, Puerto Rico, the favela, the community land trust, the Caño Martin Peña. Uh, it's after Hurricane Maria, they were in a much better position to respond as a community than other informal settlements. Um, but, and they're no longer informal, and they've become formalized through the Community Land Trust. But it's a particular mechanism where you maintain these qualities of informality. It's still, they work collectively. In fact, they work even closer together now that they collectively own the land, and they manage it and advocate for improvements together. Uh, but also, they're formal. So they have access to, you know, it, for example, the US government denied resources to many informal settlements in Puerto Rico because they didn't have title. So uh, there are ways to make it so that we could take advantage of the qualities of the resilience and the collective work that informal settlements produce and, and are natural to them, but then not keep them in the precarious state uh, that they're, they start out in. Yeah. Just to, uh, to add on this, like uh, di different c cities have different realities. So whatever works in some area could might work in another. But the the underlying thing is that informal areas have very strong social networks, and these were are the ones who keep these areas going on, and these are the ones who consolidate or uh, uh, help them with their resilience in in any other, in any situation. <laughs> Okay, I don't see anyone at the mic, so I'm going to, on behalf of all of you, thank uh, Martin, Teresa, Eliana, Richard, and Heba for their presentations today. I need to tell you that this is your refreshment break, and the refreshments are out that door and to your right. The next session starts at 3.30, and you're encouraged to participate in the sustainability trivia in the mobile app. Uh, and as I said, concurrent sessions start at 3.30. Thank you again.